Sure. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to share some of um, some ideas around architecture and learning. So the title of the lecture is Learning by Doing, because I think it's really important to get one's hands dirty and to really touch materials and not to only sit um, in an office and, and draw drawings and sit on a computer. So I want to look today at wonderful collaborations, uh, different collaborations I've had with people uh, from different institutions and just to try and, and open up some ideas about how we can teach and how we can work together. So um, I have an architectural practice called CS Studio Architects. It was established in 1989 by Ur Schmidt and myself. The office is situated in Seapoint, which is in Cape Town. It's, it's just 10 minutes from the center of the city. Um, we have a very small team. Uh, the studio is on top of our house, which we built with our own hands. And we have between one and a maximum of seven people working for us. So when we have a lot of work, there's seven. But when we don't have work, then we normally one or two people. Um, and at the moment, due to COVID, a lot of our projects were stopped. So we're reinventing ourselves and working collaboratively with other people and with uh, one staff member, a technician who comes into the office. So I would like to let's see talk a little bit about south africa and the context so that people can understand that we have 12 dominant languages so all over south africa people speak different languages so it makes it a little bit complex when you're working in different areas in the center of the, the commercial cities people speak english um, but in all the other areas you can see it's a great mixture of languages and then, of course, with these languages go different cultures. So when we look at our projects, we always look at the context and try and, and keep things as local as possible using local materials and local um, technology and local labor. And then we also uh, work in a principle of learning from the people who will use our buildings. So it's, it's so that we can not impose our ideas, but that we can maybe try and listen to the people and, and see if we can turn their um, concerns into some architectural solutions. Uh, sorry. And then the other thing in terms of the theory of our practice, we think that social, economic and environmental aspects are equally important. And um, this is, you'll see through most of the projects that we do. So we've done some workshops in Africa, in America, and in Europe, and it's very similar, the workshops we do, and sometimes it's not always architectural, it could be an urban design, a planning design, it could just be a, a, a social problem, but the form of the workshop is often very similar. So the reason why we like working in this way is that we feel the bottom-up approach, which is on the green arrow on the left, really helps people to be part of your plan so there's action there's empowerment involvement consultation a sharing of information and in that process we instill trust so often when uh, we work on other projects especially with government they are very top down and they are manipulative they ask people's opinions but they don't really listen to anybody um, they often want to self enrich themselves and there's a lot of talk and no action. So this is a typical workshop and this workshop can be done in one day, it can be done in uh, 45 minutes, it can be done in a, in a year. So it's just a tool that we use to extract solutions out of uh, a situation. So there's the A4 paper exercise where we climb through a piece of paper. So it's an icebreaker. So it's to get people to start talking to each other. Then what animal represents you? And then the helicopter exercise is one where we ask people to dream what the solution will be if they fly over the site or over the problem in 10 years time. 
And then we do a SWOT, which is the strengths, the weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. We also look at networks. We look at resources. We look at the context and some strategic planning, and then it turns into a proposal. So on the right-hand side is a typical workshop where we had 15 teachers, we had 15 architects, and we had 15 inhabitants from a housing estate. And when we started on the Monday, they were not talking to each other. And by the Friday, they were all friends and the students and teachers actually helped the inhabitants to write a business plan that they sent to the EU and they managed to get money to start a little restaurant on the campus where the students are. So the dream was in the beginning to build a building, um, but because of the um, constraints, it wasn't possible, but it was possible to find a solution. So now to just show some of the work we've been involved with. In 1982, I started working with a group of people um, in Craddock. And it, the reason in this process, I met this man who is a maths teacher in Craddock, but he was killed in, the four people were killed in 1984 by the South African police. But one day he said to me that I must really try and use architecture to uh, liberate people. So this was the group of people that I started working with. And uh, they, call, they were from a nonprofit called Craddock Mazazami. And they really had a dream to build a skills training workshop so that the, the young people who came out of universe, uh, out of school would learn a, a trade or a skill. But unfortunately, when we raised the money, the funder gave us money for a, a preschool or a creche. So here you can see the, the red block is where the creche is the red roof building, which was the first building. Then we built a library, the little yellow block, and then we built the workshops eventually. So that was the Mazazami uh, development. Then in the blue block here at the bottom, you can see is a clinic. Uh, it's a clinic that has both the government uh, curative section and the preventative se section that was run by the community. And then you can see in the yellow block is an arts and culture center with a village that we were also asked to do. So in this community, we also built uh, incredibly small starter houses, and we built about uh, 10,000 of them. They were only 17 square meters big. This was the opening in 1986 of the, the play school, the creche. Um, and here you can just see the library and the workshops that were built subsequently. Here is to show you when we do a workshop, we bring people um, from uh, this was the workshop to plan the clinic, and we brought uh, specialists, physiotherapists, agronomers, water specialists, nutritionists, so that they would give lectures and talks and discussions so that people understood health in a holistic way. So the clinic was also built with local uh, bricks and with local people, and uh, the front part of the clinic is the community uh, primary health care, and at the back is the, the government with their curative uh, health care. Then we go to Namakuland. Namakuland is about 580 kilometers from Cape Town, and in 1986 we were asked to work on a, a, a center, a community center, which is called First Steps, and here the people wanted us to remember the the way they built their nomadic huts. The people in this community were traditionally sheep and goat uh, herders. So they moved around with their herds and they lived in the mountains. But then when the missionaries, a lot of missionaries came and formed mission stations in South Africa, and then people huddled around a village. So this was the village called Komachas. Um, here was the original plan, which had, you can see in the dark black plan is the first phase of the building. The other two phases uh, were actually not built, but we did build the, uh, the hall and the, the, the library, which is upstairs. 
And because the community that we worked with couldn't read and write, we needed to draw the building exactly how it had to be built. So the builder used to count the blocks and put them down exactly according to this drawing. Um, and the building looks exactly like these drawings. So this is the street and the other elevation, and you can see the, the wooden slatted doors that we put on so that when you close them, the, the wind can blow through the building and cool the building. The site is located in a semi-desert area where it gets incredibly hot. So we used very good overhangs, good insulation. We bring the south light, that is the not the warm light, it's the, the, the natural uh, light, we bring it in. And we also bring cross ventilation through the building. There was no electricity when in, in that community at the time when we built. So um, we had to be very inventive in how we, we did things. So here you can see at the bottom right hand corner is the team of people who built the building. The man with the green and the man next to him with the project manager and the foreman. And then there were 10 um, people who were unemployed and they were unemployed because they were not working on the mine. There's a, a diamond mine next to the village, but these were the guys who were always drunk. So they were the ones who we had on our site. So every Monday they were not on site because they were sobering up, but it was still, they built a beautiful building over a period of about 12 months and they made every block on the site with river sand and cement. And then two teachers came and put the roof on um, over about two or three days. And here you can see the opening of the project. It was ex extremely exciting. The building has really served the community really, really well. And you can see the strip that lets the light in at the top there, the translucent sheeting. And this is the celebrated entrance with a, a roof to protect people from the elements. And this is about four or five years ago when I went to visit the building and the people were very, very proud. And they still, even people who were not born at the time when we built it said that this is their building. And you can see that they painted and plastered the building in the meantime. So they're continuously looking after it, which is fantastic. Then we want to go to Lanesburg, which is about 260 kilometers north of Cape Town where in 1981, there was a terrible flood and a lot of the community washed away. And when we were invited by, in 2004, by the municipality to come and work with the community to build a community center, most of the people here, yeah, you can just see the location of the building and you can see these rivers that it's incredible how people just built their new houses back in the, in the same place where the river is probably gonna flood again one day. Um, but when we asked the people what they wanted, it was very um, interesting that a lot of people were very hurt from the floods because they lost a lot of people. So we decided that we need to have a, a healing process. So we went and uh, contacted this woman in the middle here. Her name is Diane Ferris. And she is a very powerful political poet and she came and listened to the stories of these people. And the man on her left, he lost eight of his family members. So it was very tragic that nobody had ever asked him how he felt, um, what had happened to them. So everybody came and told their stories of how traumatic it was. And then she, the poet, wrote one poem. And in the poem, she spoke about the red raging bull because everybody, said the water came like a red raging bull through the village. So they also spoke about uh, typical windmills. They wanted a railway line because the village was originally started as a railway station. And then they also gave us, this is the site and wanted us to recycle all the material that we found on the site. So in the process, we built lots of models, which is a way we work to communicate ideas and to get new ideas from people. And in this case, you can see the gray is the old building that we kept, but we lifted it up with some new red steel and some new, the black brickwork. 
And once again, you can see we're cutting off the, the west sun that is a really, really hot sun um, in the Karua area. And then some lovely drawings um, that we did just to really understand how we're gonna bring this train carriage. They wanted a train carriage to be recycled for a little restaurant on top of the, the first floor level. Here you can see the, the brickwork from the old building. We, we turned it into a landscape element. Here is the train carriage that is a recycled element that we introduced. When it arrived in the town, two uh, gangsters, two little kids went and bombed it with petrol bombs and burnt it out, which was quite a dilemma for us. So we had to rebuild the whole, whole thing from scratch. Then another component was to do handrails and screens with recycling of uh, found objects. So we went around on the farms and we worked with an internationally famous South African artist called Willy Bester. And he worked and trained four of the young people from Lanesburg how to make um, these incredible handrails and screens along the staircases. So you can just see it's all things that they picked up um, we had rebar frames and then into the frames they made this themselves and some more handrails and then this is the train that we rebuilt and right at the top this was some funny rocket that we found on the recycling dump. So the people really wanted this building to be a, a celebration and a monument for everybody who drowned in the previous flood. So the building was painted um, red here you can see the, the use of the recycled material um, on, the, on the facades. Um, that was from the original roof. So we really had fun and the community had a lot of fun. And then we created this where the train comes down on its tracks. This was done with the, the, the bricks that was left over on the site because they were too broken to really use in, in building work. The sad thing is about three years ago, the government painted the building white because it was the cheapest paint to repaint the building with. Um, they've subsequently built a gym underneath here, which is, they just built it by themselves. So the building is now functional. There's a lot of activity. And here you can just see there's an ambulance here because one of the things they've done, and here you can see about five ambulances, is they formed a, a, a space where once there's an accident, there's a huge road here that has many, many accidents, vehicle accidents. And sometimes there are too many buses and say 30 people are injured, only one or two need to go to the hospital. So they bring all the other people to this building and they look after them because they said that during the flood, nobody really assisted them and looked after them. So they're trying to turn their negative thing into something positive. So the municipality of Lanesburg then asked us to look at uh, upgrading five cemeteries. And I then decided to ask uh, uh, Odile Deck whether we can work with some of her students because she planned a, a workshop at Confluence in Lyon. And this was the one major cemetery that we asked her students to look at, one of the five. Um, you can just see this was all washed away. A lot of this was washed away in the flood. And there's some more graves in this area. So this is the section that, that has been restored, um, but there's a huge area that was never restored and all you could find was stones lying around. So the, the project for the students from Confluence was to in one week really look at um, sort of an ideas project that we could then present to the municipality. So this is a wonderful idea where the student dug into the ground and, 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 and built a monument instead of doing individual graves. Uh, they were really keen on the earth and, and, and building something that you could see from far away, but then that eventually you, you sort of dug yourself into the ground. The other group wanted to make these gabion walls and you can see from their um, example they built that they built it with a plastic cage and that it doesn't work. If you've, you've got to actually have a firm cage if you want to build a gabion that makes a wall. So this was a very good exercise for all of us. And you can see they wanted to occupy the other corner, a bit of a monument. Uh, another 
group wanted to build these little gazebos for meditation um, and they looked at local skills and local materials. Uh, another group wanted to bring in water and indigenous planting. So it was really an exciting uh, thing to do. The big thing here is maintenance and who would maintain it. Then another st uh, student brought in a laboratory. He wanted to look at the indigenous plants in the area and, and really make it a place. There's also a lot of fossils in the mountains and scientists come from all over the world. And he thought to make a laboratory where the thing will be alive and it won't focus on the only the dead people. So he put his in and amongst some trees. Some other students wanted to overlay a, a garden which was really also a nice idea. And then this, man, this guy wanted to superimpose the stars, which was quite interesting. And the municipality really enjoyed uh, the presentations from the students. Unfortunately, the, the political power changed and the new people at the municipality don't really want to carry on with the project, which is very sad. Then we're going to go to a project in Langa, which is about 10 or 15 minutes outside of Cape Town. And this is uh, this project called Guga Setebe Arts and Culture Center. So I am going to explain this project, which was built by the local community. And then the second phase, the children's theater was built in a collaboration with different universities and students actually built the building at the back. So just so that you can contextualize uh, the two different projects, the one is uh, on a road called Washington Street, opposite the government um, multi-purpose multi center, and then there's a, a museum over here. So when we designed the project, we had many workshops and very nice uh, interaction with the community. Uh, we did household surveys, we did workshops, we did public meetings, and the project uh, evolved over time. It took about two years. It was a very good interactive process. And here you can just see sometimes later on in the project, we built a big one in 50 model to discuss the ceramics and the murals that we did on the building. So this golden cone that you can see comes from the fact that the older people really wanted to see a rondavel, which is a traditional round hut. So, but the young people we worked with wanted to see contemporary shapes and they wanted a modern contemporary building. So what we did is we came up with this cone and everybody seems to be enjoying it. They, they use it, they, it seems to be a landmark um, and one of the buildings that is visited the most uh, in Cape Town on the tourist route. So another activity we have when we start a building is they always traditionally have a soil turning ceremony. So I thought it would just be interesting to show you this event that is at most of the South African building projects. Here is the plan. It's a very tiny little building, about 860 square meters. Um, there's one thing that, that I didn't speak of in the beginning, but we are, have a fascination in the work we do about African space making, which is entirely different from Western European. And it's the spaces in between like this foyer space that holds together uh, the other spaces that really fascinate us. So here you can see the, the, the foyer is, is, a, is, is the gray space and the circulation that links everything. And then outside there's an amphitheater at the back. There's a little restaurant in the front that uh, has been struggling. And then there is the exhibition multipurpose. The, the circular shape is used extensively. Just again, the urban space um, in most of these areas, people don't consider designing the urban space. So we felt it was incredibly important that this thing has an identity onto the street. Um, this is uh, Ush and myself at the entrance of the building. And when you go in, you will see this big mural. It's about 2.4 by two meters big. And this thing with a maze is a Gugas Tebe. It's an idiom, it's a Koza idiom which invites everybody to come and share a meal and to share knowledge. So just to say that the name of the project is very symbolic. And 
this is at the back in the amphitheater that when we completed the building, we had a ceremony where everybody who built the building was given a certificate. And in this case, there were only two or three people from outside of Langa, but the rest of the building was entirely built, including the mechanical engineer, including the, or the mechanical subcontractor and the electrical subcontractor. They were all people who worked on site were from Langa. So it was an incredible experience. It was finished in 1999. And then we trained 10 people of 20 young people who had, were sitting on the street corners and we landed up teaching them how to make all these mosaics. And uh, they have subsequently worked on big, big projects on hotels. Um, they're still working with us on other big projects on clinics, I'll show you later, and on hotels and, and uh, uh, hospitals, uh, people are now really using this ma material on buildings. So here you can see what happens in the building. There's before COVID, we used to have between 1,000 and 3,000 tourists who would come and visit the project, see the people, listen to music, and just integrate into the system there. This is in the, uh, the cone shape where there's exhibitions, and then every afternoon, uh, this group, they, these two guys, they train uh, children from the different school how to play drums and how to play marimbas. And then sometimes a group of tourists will come and they will make quite a little bit of money that they would then share amongst the, the children and, and themselves. Uh, and this was very, very active before COVID. And it's really tragic now because it's really, there's a lot of, uh, of these spaces that were closed for a long time and we don't have any foreign tourists coming to South Africa at the moment. So now I'd like to go to the children's theater at the back. Uh, and this is for me a really exciting uh, project because it's, it's design built, which is a very controversial issue internationally at the moment. There are many people doing PhDs and writing lots of literature about this. And it, it's a very complex way of working. But we worked with an architectural magazine called uh, AIT and our office, and we worked with uh, Aachen and Peter Behren School of Architecture in uh, Düsseldorf and Georgia Tech in Atlanta and some structural engineers in Imagine in Germany. And we worked over two years to uh, design. We worked uh, with these students and with the engineers and with climate engineers and with acoustic engineers to design this project, which is built um, out of containers. So you can just see the different activities and how at the bottom here, how this long truss is carried by the students. This is the process that I just wanted to share, especially with the students that they can see what a wonderful uh, process the, this was. So the students built models, they did lots of drawings, um, they experimented, they got specialists to come and speak to them about container construction. What are the principles when you start recycling containers? How many can you put on top of each other? So it was an incredibly um, informative process. So this was happening in Germany and in America with the, with the architectural students. Um, we can see some more models, some more layouts. So it was, it, it went through many reiterations. And uh, whilst we were working here in South Africa, trying to get the plans and the land approved, the students in Germany did some extremely good work into materials research, into climate research. Um, and then they all got together in a workshop and shared all this information. So here they built life-size samples of things they wanted to try out, uh, some glass walls they thought would work. Then they did a very nice drawing that we used to do more fundraising. We raised all the money. The South African government um, and the municipality didn't want to give us any support or money. Um, they just wanted us to build the building and bring all the resources with us. And here you can see, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how this was actually built, but I think it's good that you see what it looked like close to the end so that you can follow the picture in your mind. So you can see the final, finish was these uh, fruit crate pellets that we used as a third layer onto the building. 
So firstly, we brought the containers in and here you can see that when a container is cut open, it loses its structural integrity. So once you've cut a big hole into the container, it doesn't have the structural strength that it needs. And then you have to start engineering new structure. So here you can see for the roof to carry the roof, we made a new structural system. And you can see the students here assembling that structure. This is where the truss would then sit above the container. So the truss did not actually rest on the containers themselves. Here you can see the group of students assembling the two separate trusses that came and then they assembled them um, in a jig and really built them. There were two carpenters from Germany who, who were the teachers that came with them. Um, and it was a fantastic process. And here you can see how we managed to get the crane to come and put these trusses. Um, and it went fairly fast with the crane. Um, and whilst we were building, we had a lot of interaction with the community. Here you can see there's some young kids coming to do some dancing. Uh, there were some young people looking at some videos that were showing in one corner. Here you can see some of the students uh, experiments with plastic eventually and with tires. It was too difficult to work with the tires. The plastic deteriorated in the sun too fast, so we couldn't use those methods. And here on the floor, you can see our insulation panels. They are made with um, straw and clay. And eventually, we turned the workshop in the inside of the building into the workshop for the finishes. And you can see here some lovely. Um, textiles. We ran some design workshops with textile people came from from an international workshop and they ran se separate workshops. So in total, there were over 2000 people over two years actively involved in this project. It was a very, very powerful collective effort. These are the insulation panels with a straw. And you can see at the back on the right, that is the mold that we worked with. And then this in front is when the mold is off and then you leave it for three weeks. Here you can just see the, the guys making and finishing off that thing. And then you make the straw stand for three to four weeks and it grows. This green grass grows out of it. And then you have to cut the grass when it's dead. You can cut the grass off. And here you can see how they put them onto the panels um, for the insulation of the project. Then we went to the fruit area and we got some disused fruit crates um, and we were gonna, we used this for the facade and the students did a lot of research into how they could do this. And they came up with the idea of using African fabrics and African textiles. So the final design was a result of this exploration. And here you can see how they used it in the plinth of the brickwork, but as well in the design of the, the, the fruit crates. And the principle is there's the container, here's the insulation, there's the batten, and then the, the, the fruit crate was the final finish that came onto it. And this is just when the building was finished and you can see what it looked like. The building has served one, the community in a wonderful way. It's, it's really a fantastic space. Uh, there's opera that gets done, there are parties, there's performances, jazz, it really gets used. This was the opening and you can see the curtains that we use for acoustic uh, treatment and you can see the lovely light quality inside. This was an architectural lecture that was held inside and 250 architects came from town to see an exhibition and uh, an architectural lecture. And then it gets used by uh, entrepreneurs People come and use the other spaces of the other building to also experiment with, with um, architectural elements and with training. This was an entrepreneurial workshop. And you can just see how, how pleasant the inside is when people adapt it. And then in September last year, there was a massive fire and uh, the building, uh, a huge part of the building burnt down. Uh, interestingly enough, you can see the plastic of the translucent sheeting caused the fire to run across. Um, yeah, you, the fire started in the left in the recording studio. Uh, firstly, they told us it was an electrical fire 
And then secondly, they told us that it was a fire caused by the security guard who kept his stove on and his blanket uh, went onto the stove and created the fire. So the plastic elements really spread the fire. You can see in the inside um, the, how the timber stayed and look at the containers. The containers, they really managed. But here you can see how the trusses that were on that side they, they, they stayed intact, which is incredible, and, and some of their members just broke down. But it was a massive fire, and when the fire brigade came, there was no water because somebody had turned the main water supply off to the building um, because there was a leak in one of the toilets. So it was a disaster. They had to go two kilometers away to get uh, water to put the fire out. So if there was water, they would have put it out much faster. One thing that happened is the municipality had insured the building because it was on their property. So they appointed a main contractor who was brought on board and within two months, there was no students allowed, unfortunately, but they are allowing us now to get involved. But to put the roof back on, uh, here you can see how the containers survived the fire. And here you can see how they busy and they've put the, the roof back on again and painted the containers. And now we are working with students from South Africa and artists from South Africa to redesign the ceiling layout so that the acoustics are working out. And then also um, the recording studio burnt out. So we are working with Heath Nash, who is a local artist who works at Guga Sitebe. He's gonna be designing with people from the community the recording studio. So there's going to be more local involvement because the, due to COVID, the students from Germany cannot travel to South Africa. So actually tomorrow there's a workshop on site to make the panels, the straw panels that, that were taken off there. And then after that, these fruit crates uh, will go and, and we will restore that element and the element over there. So the, the, they, the big roof is done and it's on and it's functioning. So that was just the story of, of Guga Setebe. Then I want to just tell a little other story about uh, a way we worked in Horston. This is a community that has a lot of gangsterism. It's linked to the triads. And this is Abalone, which is an aphrodisiac in, uh, in China. And they come and steal it out of uh, the sea in South Africa. And um, there's huge syndicates and they work with drugs and prostitution and Abalone. And this community is seen as the headquarters. Um, and we worked with them and thought, how can we use the abalone in the building? So we were invited by the municipality to work with the people. And it was a very exciting exercise with lots of people participating, drawing their dream, presenting their dream. And uh, they became very articulate after a year of working with them. We also worked with the school children. They did their dream and they drew it up. And everybody wanted a whale or a monument. And eventually this is what we came up with, this whale with a restaurant at the bottom and that we would use the abalone shell at the bottom of the, the building towards the street. And we would use advertising to bring in money. And then uh, the community was so powerful that they, stopped the building um, or the development of a new private luxury golf course in the area because it would have privatized the, the water resource that was there. And then the municipality took away the project. They said, we're not allowed to work on it anymore. And we decided to build a sculpture of a whale and uh, to, to challenge the municipality. So we built the sculpture, which would have been an information kiosk, and we got all the materials donated and the containers that it was going to sit on. And we would have little shops underneath. And the day we wanted to start working on site, I was phoned to say that if I come to site and somebody gets shot um, or we will get um, the police will will come and take us away from site and put us in prison. It was terribly sad. And, and I was just told if I ever came back onto that site, there would be a major problem. So we unfortunately never could go with that project. Then an intervention in Cliptown Soweto. I do a lot of work with Christoph Houten, who's an architect from Bordeaux, and Kenya Morimuta, who is from Japan. And we worked on this orphanage, which flooded. So where that orange door is, 
the water would flood into that space whenever it rained and really just made the place impossible for them to look at. So the orphanage is called Sky, and we started working with a group of students from uh, uh, Toulouse and Bordeaux and students from South Africa and some community members. And there was a lot of conflict. So Kenya decided to do some Tai Chi for 20 minutes. And after we'd done 20 minutes of Tai Chi, everybody was talking to each other and we worked very well over a two week period. So there are these different buildings of the orphanage. The orange is the kitchen. The, uh, the yellow building is where the people stay who, who run the place. And then the other building was where the children stay. And there was always cars parked in this area and this area used to flood. So we managed to get eight uh, concrete mixes from Lafarge of a very good porous concrete that would let the water go down. And then we put a drain under this whole area and we drained the water away. We lifted it and we built a, a, a little bit of an entrance into the, the doorway um, and planted the front area and also made it so that you couldn't bring cars into this area. The, some of the students uh, showed the, the, the young kids how to propagate uh, seedlings and there was a big vegetable garden. We had to make the agricultural pipe to drain the water to the garden ourselves because we couldn't buy one. Here at the back, we built an aquifer to clean the shower water because there's no drainage in these informal settlements. So the water just, the soapy water used to run into the informal settlement. And here we're just building a, 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 an aquifer to clean the water before it runs back down into the stormwater system. Then another project in Port Elizabeth where I worked a little bit just giving advice to the collective saga. So they also, they're from Nantes and they managed to build this really beautiful building and do very clever drawings. It's also using a lot of recycled materials. Um, they worked also with some local architects in Port Elizabeth. Just see how they use the wood. Here you can see during the building phase, they had exhibitions, they showed videos, they showed their own context. So it was really a sharing uh, with the people uh, in the area. And here you can see this, the, the project in its finished state and that beautiful wall with the, the bottles and the, the door that is managed with the skateboard to slide. The windows also open in a very inventive way. So this is the team. We, we're trying to do some other work together. Uh, Simon is, is the, the guy who's really the link with South Africa, but they, they were final year students. They're now graduates and they're getting registered. And then the final project is a project in Cape Town in, a, in, a, in what is our new normal, uh, where housing looks like this. If you have a job and you have a salary and you can go to the bank and get a loan, you get a, what they call a gap house. But if you are really poor and you don't have a job, you get what they call a RDP house, which is just, um, and I'll show later, it's, it, this is all um, about four or five apartments in one block. Uh, and then we were asked to build a clinic um, to serve this area. And I realized immediately that there were no public buildings and no public spaces. So the, the sense of urbanity and of civic scale is just non-existent in these communities. You will find that there are uh, uh, churches, mosques and schools, but the, the quality of the space is not really that there's a place for people to go to and to spend time. So you'll find people come to this clinic and you'll see that this is a, a road where taxis, they drop people there. People can come and wait in that area and that's the main waiting area. And then there's a big in, internal courtyard for children to play in. So this is another thing that I mentioned earlier, the government, I had to really beg this man to come and explain the project to the community and, and set up some dialogue. Um, they wouldn't really let it happen before the building was completely designed, but I managed to talk to the community um, behind the government's back. And so my, many of the ideas are actually in the building. Here you can see the model of the project. And this is Typically when we worked, because the people who live in this area speak English, Afrikaans and Kosa, so all our graphics, we try to incorporate the three different languages. 
and we try to show the people in the beginning what are they going to get, what it is going to look like, so that it wasn't just a surprise at the end. Here you can see the plan. Uh, this is the waiting area that becomes a community facility. Here's a pharmacy, uh, the records, and here's a dental, a fully operational dental clinic. So it's a really, really very, very powerful facility. And, and we are extremely grateful that, that they allowed us to build something like this. We do these big one in 20 sections. I think some of the students at Reunion, I've also worked with you and, and got you to do one in 20 sections because you can show materials and you can really show the space. Some elevations and then the outside, the urban space that we spoke about. How do you make children feel that the scale of the building is theirs? They can play, they're safe, their parents can be inside, but the kids are fairly safe on the outside. Here you can see people come with all their children. They don't come alone. They bring because there's nobody to look after the children at home. So here you can say just the element that draws the people in. And there's always access for people in wheelchairs and people with disabilities. And we did the very nice mosaic work. This man was probably the most powerful person on site. He was a local leader in the community, but also an excellent bricklayer. So he managed the quality of the building work. So when we saw that there was bad quality, he would intervene and help to sort that out. And we learned a lot of lessons from this man. And here we show you how the training for the mosaic was happening with 16 young people. So this was one of the people we worked with at Guga Setebe. He was trained at Guga Setebe and he subsequently trains other people how to do mosaic work. You can see this. They did a plan at the entrance outside. There are these beautiful uh, mirror, the mirrors that, that shimmer. And then you see these people at the entrance. There's a man that guards the entrance and a woman on the other side. And then this is the area that people come at seven or 6.30 early, early in the morning and they just have to sit. They put their name in here on a system and then they sit and wait um, until they can go inside. So we made it a natural light, natural ventilation, a really pleasant place for, for people to wait. Here you can see towards the door that's towards the, the public ablution facility. And then this is the little information office where you come and get any information you want. And here you can see what I was talking about. Now I want to please show you, these are doors that close, roller shutter doors in front of the pharmacy. And on that side, it can also close in front of the reception because that allows the clinic to be used for other community activities. There's thousands of people who use this facility. It's a really good facility. People are very happy with, with the spatial quality. They really enjoy, they come from far away just to come to this facility. And here you can see, this was an audition for a talent show that, uh, um, that happens once a year in, South, in Cape Town. And it was fantastic that the people could come and do the the audition for the talent show in the waiting room and that the, the management and the staff allowed this to happen. So this, they look, look, a lot of community activity happen in there. These are the passages and you can see they wide and they allow a lot of light to come in, a lot of ventilation. Um, here you can see people waiting. There's always natural light with all the buildings. Every room has got natural light through windows. Uh, there's an air conditioning system, which they never put on, um, so, which was a requirement by the government. And then this is the inside of, the, of a typical um, uh, consulting room. And then just the typical passages, everything has got a color code. So it's really easy to if they say to them, go to the infectious disease, it's the yellow, they know exactly where to go to. The mural people also made this lovely, um, mountain and it was a world design capital project. It was chosen as one of the projects in South Africa. And here you can see the mixture of mosaic and real uh, planting. It's all indigenous. All the landscaping was also done by our office and it's all indigenous planting. Um, here you can see the children just really enjoying that space. And this is the housing I was showing you the plan in the beginning. So that is a whole house. So what is happening is that South Africans get a unit like this 
and then they rent it out to an immigrant to get uh, income and then they stay in an informal settlement where they don't have to pay. So a lot of people in South Africa are renting out their houses like this to people from Somali, Bangladesh, uh, the Congo. It's yeah, it's it's a it's a very uh, very strange economic system that they're introducing. So this is the front of the building, um, and you can just see how this and this starts talking to each other. Kids playing outside. We really, really wanted to make the thing look not institutional, but something that's very welcoming for the residents in the area. So the other thing, we also have goats and, and cattle walking around still, which, which is why there's, there's fences and, and things around, there are courtyards in between uh, all the little buildings to make every room uh, completely uh, lit. And here you can see the, 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 the shading uh, to the Northwest and you can see a mesh, there's stainless steel mesh because there's a lot of problem with gangs in the area. So security is a major issue. And this is just how the building looks at night. Um, it's that you close that door and everything is secure. There's literally a, a, a gate to the parking and one entrance. And this is something that is really critical for us um, with our security, high security problems. We really have to design for it, but at the same time, allow for something that is soft and friendly. And this is just my final slide last year. I think I started on the slide. So this is it. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you.